in this lecture we will look at the ethernet switching this is the module 7 of the introduction to networks by cisco netacad if you would like to look at the previous modules and lectures i will leave a link in the description for the playlist in this module we will explain how ethernet works in a switch network we will look at ethernet frame ethernet mac address the mac address table and switch speeds and forwarding methods so let's look at the ethernet frames the ethernet encapsulation the ethernet operate in the data link layer and the physical layer it is a family of networking technologies defined in the IEEE 802.2 .2 and IEEE 802.3 standards. On your right hand side, you have the stack for OSI model and you see the data link and physical layer and 802.2 .2 covers the LLC in the data link and the 802.3 covers the uh, Mac in the data link and the physical layer. In combination of 802.2 .2 and 802.3, uh, defined what we call the Ethernet. The 802 LAN MAN standards, including the Ethernet, use two separate sublayers of the data link layer to separate uh, operate. They are LLC sublayer and the MAC sublayer. The LLC sublayer, as I mentioned before, is defined by the IEEE 802.2 which places information in the frame to identify which network layer protocol is used for the frame. While the MAC sublayer, which used the IEEE 802.3, IEEE 802.11, or IEEE 802.15, responsible for the data encapsulation and media access control, and provides data link layer addressing. On your right hand side, you can see the diagram of the data link and it is divided into LLC sublayer and MAC sublayer just like the previous slide. And we have the physical layer underneath it and the network and other layers are on top of it. MAC sublayer. The MAC sublayer is responsible for data encapsulation and accessing the media. Data encapsulation is defined in IEEE 802.3 data encapsulation uh, methodology that includes uh, Ethernet frame, Ethernet addressing, and Ethernet error detection. The Ethernet frame is defined as the internal structure of the Ethernet frame, while Ethernet addressing is responsible for both the source and destination MAC address to deliver the Ethernet frame from Ethernet network interface card to the Ethernet network interface card on the same LAN. Remember, when you send packets from NIC to NIC, a network interface card to network interface card, it should have a source and a destination address. And that information is taken care of by the Ethernet addressing. The Ethernet error detection is the Ethernet frame includes a frame check sequence, FCS trailer used for error detection. I briefly went over all of these items on my previous lecture. Again, you can check that in my YouTube channel. Uh, but for now, just remember that a, for this lecture, IEEE 802.3 is responsible for data encapsulation and it includes Ethernet frame, Ethernet addressing, and Ethernet error detection. MAC sublayer responsible for media access. So the IEEE 802.3 MAC sublayer includes the specification for different Ethernet communication standards over various types of media, including copper and fiber. Legacy Ethernet using a bus topology or hubs is a shared half duplex medium. And the Ethernet over a half duplex medium uses a contention based access method carrier sense multiple access collision detection or CSMA slash CD. So you need to remember that the legacy Ethernet e, such as the bus topology will be using the contention based um, access method. The Ethernet LANs of today use switches that operates in full duplex. Full duplex communications with Ethernet switches do not require access control through CSA, CSMA CD. 
So that's an important concept that you should remember for your exams and quizzes. Legacy still need the CSA MA slash CD, but the modern day full duplex Ethernet switches do not require that. So this is a, uh, a brief overview of uh, Ethernet frame fields. So we have the field of uh, preamble, uh, which, which is uh, start frame uh, delimiter fields. We have the destination MAC address field, and we have the source MAC address field. Then we have the type and length uh, data field, and then finally we have the frame check sequence. So if you look at a, um, you know, a Ethernet frame, you will have the preamble, uh, we have the destination, we have the source, remember the destination and source MAC addresses, this is gonna take up about six bytes each, and then we have the type, and we have the data, which is sometimes called the payload, and then we have the frame check sequence. You can post this video on this uh, uh, slide, and you can read over this information. I will not go through any detail uh, what's in here, uh, but um, you should be able to uh, define each of these categories, these fields uh, for your exams and quizzes in this particular module. Ethernet frame fields. The minimum Ethernet frame size is 64 bytes and the maximum is the 1518 bytes. The preamble field uh, is not included when describing the size of the frame. So when we look at the minimum or maximum of a Ethernet frame, which is 64 bytes to 1516 bytes, we don't include the preamble uh, field. Any frame less than 64 bytes in length is considered a collision fragment or runt frame and is automatically discarded. Frames with more than 1,500 bytes of data are considered jumbo or baby giant frames. If the size of a transmitted frame is less than the minimum or greater than the maximum, the receiving device drops the frame. Drop frames are likely to be result of collisions or other unwanted signals. They are considered invalid. However, the jumbo frames are usually supported by most fast Ethernet and Gigabit uh, Ethernet switches and network interface cards. An Ethernet frame is not processed, is discarded if it is smaller than the minimum 64 bytes or if the calculator frame check sequence or FCS value does not match the received FCS value. So. Remember, the Ethernet frame is not processed if the size is smaller than the minimum of 64 bytes or the calculated frames check sequence FCS value does not match the received FCS value. However, it, if it is over the maximum, it may be uh, processed because of the jumbo frames um, are supported by most fast Ethernet and gigabyte LAN switching systems. Introduction to the Ethernet frame. So remember previously, we just went over this. We have the preamble, start of the frame delimiter, the destination address, the source address, the length, the 802.2 header and data, sometimes called payload, and we have the frame check sequence. The preamble and the start frame delimiter fields used for synchronization between the sending and receiving devices. So when you send a packet, that preamble is the one that actually makes sure that the synchronization is properly done between that packet and the device uh, that is receiving or sending it as well as the other packets on the network. The length and the type field identifies the upper layer protocol encapsulated in the Ethernet frame. For example, in IPv4, we have a 0x800 and IPv6, we have 0x86DD. Those are like the upper layer protocol encapsulations. Then data, field or payload fields contain the encapsulated data from a higher layer. All frames must be at least 64 bytes long. So that is that is an important concept. So right here, uh, we have the, uh, you know, the data or the payload fields and uh, that 
has to be uh, at least 64 bytes in length. The actual payload itself, actual data itself. Frame check sequence or FCS, which is the, the last uh, part of this, this one, uh, is used to detect errors in frame with cyclic redundancy checks, which actually about four bytes. That's why it says four right here. If calculations match at the source and receiver, no error occurs. So this is like a, like a fingerprint. I always describe, you know, frame check sequence or CFCS like a fingerprint, just to make sure it match on uh, the either end. So the frame uh, check sequence or the, uh, the the trailer data link layer protocols add a trailer to the end of each frame. In a process called error detection, the trailer determines if the frame arrived without error. It places a logical or mathematical summary of the bits that comprise the frame in the trailer. The data link layer adds error detection because the signals on the media could be subject to interference, distortion, or loss that would substantially change the bit values that those signals represent. A transmitting node creates a logical summary of the contents of the frame known as the cyclic redundancy check or CRC value. This value is placed in the frame check sequence C as FCS field to represent the contents of the frame. In the Ethernet trailer, the FCS provides a method for the receiving node to determine whether the frame experienced transmission errors. So remember I mentioned uh, FCS as a fingerprint. So it just, you know, just to make sure there are no errors from uh, after it, the sender has sent the frame uh, when it's received by the uh, receiver. So in, in transmission, the error detection is done through that FCS, the frame check sequence. If you are registered with the Cisco NetAcad or we, uh, registered with an organization, academic organization uh, for this particular course, Introduction to Networks, CCNA, you should be able to do the lab uh, described in this particular slide. I will not include the lab in this lecture video. However, I will do the lab and post it to my YouTube channel later and I will leave a link below uh, for you to view. But however, instead of you watching me doing the lab, you should actually log into your Cisco NetAcad account and download the lab and do it so that you will understand how it works. Now we will look at the Ethernet MAC addresses. Layer 2 addresses, also referred to as a physical address, is basically a, the MAC address. It contains in the frame header, used only for local delivery of a frame on the link, updated by each device that forwards the frame. So remember, I have been hammering this to uh, your head for the last couple of lectures. The MAC address changes like the, he the, the he header, you know, frame related to MAC address changes every single time it goes through a hop. Like for example, it is used for local delivery of the frame link and it, it get updated every single time it goes through one of these routers. So the, Mac, the, the source and destination MAC address in from, from the source to the port on the left hand side of this router remain the same because the source gonna be this MAC address and the destination gonna be MAC address of this port of this router. But when that frame leaves that router and start sending that frame to the next router, the MAC address source, source MAC address, gonna be the source of the right-hand side port of this router, and the destination MAC address gonna be the left, uh, um, uh, sorry, this is gonna be the left-hand side, sorry, left-hand side. So when 
So when the frame leaves this router one, the the MAC address of the source going to be the the right uh, the sorry right hand side port of this router, while the receiving port, in this case router two left hand side port, going to uh, MAC address going to be the destination MAC address of that frame. So I want to repeat that again because I may have confused some of you. So physical addresses or MAC addresses are used for local delivery of frames. So when the source send the frame out, the initially it's going to have the MAC address of the source. In this case, this computer network interface card and the destination MAC address of the destination, which is going to be the left hand side router one port MAC address. But when the router one forward that frame to the next router, the source MAC address will be changed to the MAC address of the port on the right hand side of the router one. And the, des the destination MAC address going to be the MAC address of the router two uh, left hand side port. So that's what you need to understand. So every single time this frame gets switched or this frame get forwarded from each hop, each router, the MAC address, the source and destination changes in the frame. But also you need to understand, even though it does change the MAC address, it doesn't change the source and destination IP addresses. We will cover that in a later, uh, you know, in this these lectures. But MAC address does change each hop, but the IP address doesn't. So that's very important concept in layer two, ad layer two addresses. So what is the structure of MAC address? Media access control or MAC addresses based on hexadecimal values. Hexadecimal values or numbers are often represented by the value uh, pr proceeded by 0x, example 0x73, to distinguish between decimal and hexadecimal values in documentation. There are six bytes um, or 48 bit, uh, and 48 bits. All MAC addresses must be unique to Ethernet device. Host address such, such as PC, routers, etc. have a physical burn-in permanent uh, MAC addresses. Uh, about this, um, on later advanced lectures, I will show you how you can spoof or change your MAC addresses uh, even though the MAC address may be burned in or permanently uh, added to your um, network interface card. But for now, just remember uh, the host uh, PCs, routers, and so on and so on have burn in permanent MAC addresses. First three bytes assigned by IEEE called the OUI or Organi Organizationally Unique Identifier. Last three bytes assigned by the vendor. Each number only used once, so each MAC address is globally unique. So what that means is basically the first three bytes uh, of all Cisco uh, devices, for example, or most Cisco devices are gonna have the same uh, uh, IEEE assigned unique identifier, while the last three bytes are used uh, by wh whatever you know, vendor gonna assign a random number so that not all their uh, devices gonna have the same MAC address. While the o what you need to remember in this slide is for your exams is OUI or the U U organizationally unique identifier is assigned by IEEE, and OUI is typically same for all Cisco devices. Typically same for all D-Link devices. It's typically same for all uh, other, uh, you know, network uh, equipment manufacturers for within their manufacturing devices. While the last three bytes are used by randomly uh, by the uh, manufacturer to assign random MAC addresses, so they won't have the same MAC addresses on two devices. For now, you also need to remember the MAC addresses are burn in and permanent, but however, like I mentioned, there are ways to spoof, spoof MAC addresses and I'll describe that in a cyber security uh, lecture in a later this year. MAC address and hexadecimal. An Ethernet MAC address consists of a 48-bit binary value. 
expressed using 12 hexadecimal values. Given that 8 bits, which is one byte, is a common binary group, uh, grouping, binary 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 can be represented in a hexadecimal as a range of 0, 0 to FF. So given 8 bits, which is a one byte, in binary start with the zeros to ones, and that it can be in hexadecimal can be described the same range as 0, 0 to FF. That's a very important concept. When using hexadecimal, leading zeros are always displayed to complete the 8-bit representation. For example, the binary value of 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 is represented in hexadecimal as 0A. So, the, you know, when you're using hexadecimal, the leading zeros are always displayed in 8-bit representation. That's also an important concept. Hexadecimal numbers are often represented by the value preceded by 0x, example 0x slash 73, to distinguish between decimal and hexadecimal values in documentation. So if you see this 0x, like the leading 0x, that basically means it, it is a hexadecimal number. Hexadecimal may also be represented by a subscript 16 or hex number followed by an H. An example would be 73H, basically means this is a hexadecimal value. So that those are very important concepts that you should know for your quizzes and exams. Ethernet MAC address. In an Ethernet LAN, every network device is connected to the same shared media. MAC addressing provides a method for device identification at the data link layer of the OSI model. Remember how I mentioned that each network interface card or each port or device must have a unique IP, sorry, a unique MAC address on your network? And this is why, because it is the MAC address that we use in the OSI module, model to identify uh, each device from the other. Like separate, make sure that you don't mix them up. So having a unique MAC address is like having a unique home address in, within, in, uh, within a street. It basically identify that specific device using that specific MAC address. An Ethernet MAC address is a 48-bit address expressed using 12 hexadecimal digits because a, bytes e because a byte equals to 8 bits. We can also say that a MAC address is a 6 bytes in length. All MAC addresses must be unique to Ethernet device or device inter Ethernet interface. To ensure this, all vendors that sell Ethernet devices must register with IEEE to obtain a unique six uh, hexadecimal uh, example, you know, 24 bit or three byte code called the organizational unique identifier, which we just went over, or UI. An Ethernet MAC address consists of a six hexadecimal vendor OUI code followed by a six hexadecimal vendor assigned value. An example is shown on the uh, bottom of the screen. Uh, you have a organizational unique identifier. So we have hex values here. Bunch, uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six hex values. And those six hex values compose of three bytes. And then we have a vendor assigned random uh, or uh, some kind of a, a f other format uh, value here with one, two, three, four, five, six, another six hexa uh, hex values. E again, those two of those hex values create a byte and therefore we have three bytes here. So we have three bytes, six hex on the OUI and we have three bytes, six hex on the vendor sign value on the other remaining um, uh, uh, section of your MAC address. Frame processing. When a device is forward, forwarding a ma message to an Ethernet network, the Ethernet header includes a source MAC address and a destination MAC address. Again, I'm not gonna go over this over and over uh, in, in, in any more depth because I have been repeating this over and over for you for the previous couple of slides, but this is a very important concept. That's why I'm repeating it. So when, the, when a device forward a message on an Ethernet network, 
remember the header includes the source Mac and the destination. So we have a source Mac and the destination Mac. When a network interface card receives an Ethernet frame, it examines the destination MAC address to see if it matches the physical MAC address that is stored in the RAM. If there is no match, the device discards the frame. If there is a match, it process so sorry, it passes the frame up the OSI layers where the de-encapsulation process takes place. Note the Ethernet network interface cards will also accept frames if the destination MAC address is a broadcast or a multicast group of which the host is a member. So remember that Ethernet network interface cards will also accept frames if the destination MAC address is a broadcast or a multi-group of which the host is a member. I will describe exactly what exactly what that means in a different um, lecture or when we move forward with these lectures but just remember that for now any device that is the source or destination of an ethernet frame will have an ethernet network interface card and therefore a mac address this includes workstations servers printers mobile devices and routers so what that means is that basically every single device that you have on your network that has a network interface card or some kind of a network connection which should have a network interface card will have a MAC address. It doesn't matter whether it's a workstation, a server, a printer, even a cell phone. It could be a wireless cell phone. It still need to have a MAC address to access the network. So we have unicast, broadcast, and multicast. Unicast, when a frame is sent from a single transmitting device to a single destination, that is called a unicast. In broadcast, all host will receive the frame. Then it is get flooded out, all ethernet switch ports, like flooded out through all ethernet switch port, except the incoming port. However, it is not forwarded by a router. In multicast, a group of hosts are gonna receive uh, the Ethernet frame, such as like shown in the here, right, 01005E, and then the rest of the the rest of the MAC address with this access on it are bytes that are formed from an from the IP multicast address. It is flooded out all Ethernet switch ports except the incoming port. It is not forwarded by a router unless the router is configured to route multicast packets. This is very important. In broadcast, it is not forwarded by a router at all, but in multicast, if the router is configured to route multicast packet, it will forward, otherwise it will not forward by a router. Unicast MAC address. In Ethernet, different MAC addresses are used for layer two unicast, broadcast, and multicast communications. A unicast MAC address is the unique address that is used when a frame is sent from a single transmission de de transmitting device to a single destination device. So basically, you have one device and you're gonna send to this exact same server device. So it's just gonna go through that, that's it. The process that a source host uh, uses to determine the destination MAC address associated with an IPv4 address is known as the Address Resolution Protocol, also known as ARP. You're gonna hear this term a lot in this course as well as in your future networking carriers. The process that a source host uses to determine the destination MAC address associated with an IPv4 address is called ARP or Address Resolution Protocol. The process that source host uses to determine the destination MAC address associated with an IPv6 address is no, known as the ND or the net neighbor discovery. So the neighbor discovery and address resolution protocols are very important concepts that you should understand. The source MAC address must always be a unicast. That's a very important concept as well. The source MAC address 
must always be a unicast because it's actually coming from a one single device and it should be attached to that one single device. Broadcast MAC address. An Ethernet broadcast frame is received and processed by every device on the Ethernet LAN. The features of an Ethernet broadcast are as follows. So we have three bullet points associated with that. So the Ethernet broadcast frame has a destination MAC address of FFFFFFFFF in a hexadecimal 48 uh, ones in binary. It is flooded out of all Ethernet switch ports except the incoming port. It is not forwarded by a router. And if the encapsulated data is an IPv4 broadcast packet, this means the packet contains a destination IPv4 address that has all ones in the host portion. This numbering in the address means uh, that all hosts on the local network, in other words, the broadcast domain, will receive and process the packet. So I'm going to repeat that again. If the encapsulated data is an IPv4 broadcast packet, this means the packet contains a destination IPv4 address that has all ones in the host portion. And the numbering in the address means that the host on that local network, which we call, no, call it broadcast domain, will receive and process the packet. Multicast MAC address. An Ethernet multicast frame is received and processed by a group of devices that belong to the same multicast group. That is a very important concept. The multicast MAC address, an Ethernet multicast frame is received and processed by a group of devices that belong to the same multicast group. There is a destination MAC address of 01005E when the encapsulated data is an IPv4 multicast packet and a destination MAC address of 33-33 when the encapsulated data is an IPv6 multicast packet. So how we disting distinguish uh, IPv4 from, from IPv6 is that 33-33 uh, and uh, 01005E, uh, you know, um, encapsulation data information. There are other reserved multicast destination MAC addresses for when encapsulated data is not IP, such as uh, spanning tree protocol or STP. We're going to learn about STP in this course as well as my future courses as well. Um, but you know, just for now, just remember there are other multicast destination MAC addresses as well, such as STP. It is flooded out all Ethernet switch ports except the incoming port unless the switch is configured for multicast snooping. It is not forwarded by a router unless the router is configured to route multicast packets. So you may have noticed in this lecture that there are always uh, exceptions or <laughs> such as MAC address is burned into a network interface card but you can still spoof the MAC address. and. You know, there are exceptions here as well. It says, hey, you know, it is always flooded out of all Ethernet switch ports except the incoming port unless the switch is configured for multicast snooping. So you might be wondering as a new student uh, or someone who's new to network engineering or network systems, you know, what, what does these exceptions mean? Uh, but for now, don't worry about these things. In advanced lectures, I will explain what is multicast uh, snooping and how you can configure a router to, to route multicast packet. Uh, for this lecture, what you need to understand is uh, in multicast MAC addresses, it does not get forwarded by a router. Uh, and, um, you know, it, the switch port will, you know, uh, unless the switch, switch is configured in for multicast snooping, uh, it will get flooded out by all the ports in the switch. For this class, that's what you need to understand. Because multicast addresses represent a group of addresses, sometimes called the host group, they can only be used as the destination of a packet. 
the source will always be a unicast address. Again, the source going to be always going to be a unicast address because it has a one single source uh, origination point, right? As with the unicast and broadcast addresses, the multicast IP address requires a corresponding multicast MAC address. So without that corresponding MAC address, it's not going to work. So on the right hand side, uh, this is what exactly the Cisco is trying to explain it to you. So you have the source MAC address and you have the destination MAC address and you have the source and destination IP on that packet with the data uh, and the trailer at the end. So that's what it's showing here. So basically how it's going to work with multicast is that the source or the host going to send that packet, that, that frame, and that frame going to reach that uh, um, intermediary uh, networking device such as a switch. And in this switch, it's going to get forwarded to those multiple destinations that this packet ne needs to reach. In this case, these three devices, but not these two devices. But all of them going to receive it, but these two, three are the one going to be be processing those that frame. Again, there is a lab uh, for looking at these uh, processes uh, in your Cisco NetAcad or your academic institution uh, lab manuals. And I will not go through this lab in this lecture video. However, I will try to post a video on uh, I'm doing that lab. Uh, a lab demonstration on my YouTube channel later. If you have access to your Cisco NetAcad, you should go ahead and do the lab right now so that will, you will understand how to how these things work instead of just watching me doing the lab uh, when I post that link. The MAC address table. So we're going to look at some switch fundamentals with respect to the MAC address table. Uh, layer 2 uh, switch uses layer 2 MAC addresses to make forwarding decisions. It is completely unaware of the data uh, protocol being carried in the data portion of the frame, such as an IP packet, v4 packet, an ARP message, or an IPv6 ND packet. The switch makes its forwarding decisions based only on the layer 2 uh, ethernet mac address so even the when the switch receive the frame the only way switch going to make that forwarding decision is be all, always only based on the ethernet mac addresses the layer 2 ethernet mac addresses right the ethernet switch examines the mac address table to make a forwarding decision for each frame Unlike legacy Ethernet hubs that repeats bits uh, out all uh, ports except the incoming ports, it's just going to use the MAC address table to determine where the frame needs to be forwarded. When a switch is turned on, the MAC address table is empty be because the MAC address table is stored in the RAM. So every single time you reboot a switch or turn off and turn back on, the MAC address table is going to get wiped. Note, the MAC address table is sometimes referred to as a content addressable memory or CAM table. This is an important concept because sometimes you may find documentation in your career or when you are studying uh, network engineering uh, that may refer to MAC address table as CAM tables or the content addressable memory. Switch learning and forwarding. So we're going to examine the source MAC address. Every frame that enters a switch is checked for new information to learn. It does this by examining the source MAC address of the frame and the port number where the frame entered the switch. So this is a very important concept for your exams and quizzes. So every frame that enters a switch is checked for new information to learn. And how it's going to do that is to look at the source MAC address and the port number where the frame entered the switch. If the source MAC address does not exist, it is added to the table along with the incoming port number. However, if the source MAC address does exist, the switch updates the refresh timer for that entry. And by default, 
Most Ethernet switches keep an entry in the table for about five minutes. So that those are very important concepts. So if the source MAC address does not exist, it is added to the table along with the incoming port number. If the source MAC address does exist, the switch updates the refresh timer for that entry. And by default, most Ethernet switches keep an entry in the table for about five minutes. Please note, if the source MAC address does exist in the table, but on a different port, the switch treats this as a new entry. The entry is replaced using the same MAC address, but with more current port number. So again, this is also an important concept. If the source MAC address does exist in the table, but the port is different now, right? The port has changed. The switch treats this as a new brand new entry. And this entry is replaced using the same MAC address, but with a different or more current port number. So basically it's gonna replace that old port number with the new port number associated with that MAC address. Find the destination MAC address. So in other words, the forwarding. So the previous one, we learn, uh, we, uh, learn about like the examine the source MAC address. That means the switch is currently learning this information. Next, we're gonna look at how the switch is gonna forward that information. So if the destination MAC address is a unicast address, the switch will look for a match between the destination MAC address of the frame and the entry in its MAC address table. If the destination MAC address is in the table, it will forward the frame out the specific port, right? So remember, if the destination MAC address is a unicast address, and if the destination MAC address is in the table, it will forward the frame out the specified port. If the destination MAC address is not in the table, the switch will forward the frame out all ports except the incoming port. This is called uh, call an unknown unicast. If the destination MAC address is a broadcast or multicast, the frame is also flooded out of all ports except the incoming port. So those are key important concepts that you should know. So if the destination MAC address is in the table, it will be forwarded uh, to through that specified port. And if the destination MAC address is not in the table, it will forward it out of all ports except the incoming port. And if the, des if the destination MAC address is a broadcast or a multicast, then the frame is also flooded out of all ports except the incoming port. So those are important concepts for your exams. Remember, you need to remember those concepts. Filtering frames. As a switch receives frames, from different devices, it is able to populate its MAC address table by examining the source MAC address of every frame. When the MAC address table of the switch contains the destination MAC address, it is able to filter the frame and forward out a single port. When a device has an IP address that is on a remote network, the Ethernet frame cannot be sent directly to the destination device. Instead, the Ethernet frame is sent to the MAC address of the default gateway or the router. So that's another important concept. So if you have a device in your home and trying to reach to google.com, when the device has an IP address that is a remote network, in this case the google.com server, the Ethernet frame cannot be sent directly from your home computer to the destination device. Instead, what's gonna happen is the ethernet frame is sent to the MAC address of the default gateway. In that case, gonna be your show cable router uh, or your TELUS or a Bell, uh, you know, Canadian internet service provider routers. And then that gateway or the router of your show cable gonna forward that information out to the internet. So that's an important concept that you should learn. Switch port fundamentals. Layer two uh, LAN switch. They connects uh, and uh, it connects uh, devices uh, to a central intermediate uh, device on most Ethernet networks. 
uh, they perform switching uh, and filtering based only on the MAC address and they build a MAC address table that it uses to make forwarding decisions. And finally, it depends on the routers uh, to pass data between IP uh, subnetworks. So it depends on the routers to you know pass that data between IP subnetworks. And all of these uh, points that we actually just covered uh, in this lecture just a few minutes ago. So those are important, just a summary of what we just learned. Switch MAC address table. A switch determines where to forward incoming frames by comparing frames destination MAC address with information stored in its MAC address table. May use special memory called the content addressable memory or CAM so sometimes it is also known as the CAM table. So the MAC address table and CAM tables are like interchangeable synonyms. You can think about that way. The MAC address table is a list of each learned MAC address and its corresponding port. The switch learns new MAC address of the port info by looking at the source MAC of every frame received. So like for example, it will receive a uh, message from FA01. So FA01 port would be right here and it will be coming from the PC1. And the PC1 have a MAC address of this and it will be added to that CAM table or the MAC address table as this MAC address being associated that with that FA01. And when the PC3 uh, send a um, uh, frame and that frame contain uh, the PC3's information on FA021, uh, uh, the switch gonna associate that port FA021 with the MAC address of that PC3. In this case, that's gonna be this one uh, in that table, the, the CAM table or the MAC address table. And so on and so forth. All of these PCs, when they are communicating and sending frames through this switch, through this switch, this switch keep adding those MAC addresses and the port addresses associated with them to the, uh, its CAM table or its MAC address table. So that's what is showing on this bottom of this your screen. How does switch learn new MAC address? So remember when a switch shut down or reboot or just powered on or added uh, newly added to a network, it doesn't know the MAC, the MAC addresses within the network. So the switch receive a broadcast frame from, in this example, PC1 on port one. So it, it's receive a frame and the switch enters the source MAC address and the switch port that receive the frame into the address table. Just like I mentioned in my previous slide. Because the destination address is a broadcast, the switch floods all frames, uh, sorry, or switch flood the frame to all ports except the port on which it receives the frame. So if the frame is received from this port number one, it's gonna flood port two and port three, but it's not gonna flood the port one because that's the received uh, port, right? The destination device reply to the broadcast with a unicast frame address to the PC one. So the destination frame, so the destination device, sorry, in this case, let's say the PC two, it's gonna send a unicast frame address specifically to the PC one, um, and you know that as a reply to that the broadcast um, uh, from the, it received from the PC one. Then the switch enters the MAC address of the PC two and the port number of the switch port that received the frame into the address table. So that that CAM table now have another entry. The destination address of the frame and its associated port is found in the MAC address table as a result. The switch can now forward frames between the source and the destination devices without flooding all its ports because now it has the entries in the address table that identify the associated ports for both PC1 and PC2. Note the MAC address table is sometimes referred to as the content addressable table or CAM table. So I have been using those both MAC address table and CAM table interchangeably 
in this lecture so that you know you get used to hearing both switch forwarding actions so this is a summary that nicely put together the switch forwarding act actions into a one single table uh, if I were you and studying for an exam, I would post uh, this video right here uh, or take a screenshot of this and just remember these items because these do show up on exams, Cisco exams almost always. Guaranteed you're going to have an ex exam questions on this. So I'm going to quickly go over this. So we have the type of de uh, destination address. We have three types, unicast, broadcast, and multicast. And we have the destination address is in the MAC address table. We're gonna check that whether it's there or whether it's not there. And based on that, two pieces of information, the type of destination address and whether the destination address uh, is in the MAC address table, uh, the action with the switch, switch gonna take gonna change. For example, if you have a unicast um, uh, type, and if you know uh, the destination MAC address, it sends the frame out to the indicated uh, port. But if there is no information about the destination and the switch doesn't know about the destination, it will flood frame out all active ports except the incoming port. In a broadcast type, what's gonna happen is there is no, uh, no such thing as a destination. It's just gonna blood. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's just gonna flood frames out of all active ports except the incoming port. Because remember, the whole point of a broadcast is just to flood all ports, and that's exactly what the switch gonna do. Because switch not gonna have any destination information. It's just gonna flood every single port except the incoming port. This is a, a exam question that I got on a Cisco exam. So make sure you remember the the the, the, the uh, incoming port never get flooded. It's only gonna get flooded the the all the other ports except the incoming port. In multicast type, again, if it knows the MAC address of the destination, it sends out to the indicated ports. Uh, so it's gonna have a multiple ports, but they all associated with a specific MAC address and a port. But if we don't know any of those information, it will again get flooded out of all active ports except the incoming port. So those are important concepts. And again, you can post this video or take a screenshot of this diagram because this will show up on your exam for sure. It has been on exam, Cisco exam for many times and it will be for yours as well. Most likely show up on your exam. There's a video posted on my YouTube channel. It is directly from Cisco NetAcad. If you have access to your Cisco NetAcad modules, either through your academic institution or your registration uh, with the Cisco, you can directly watch that video on their site. If not, it's posted on my uh, YouTube channel. You can go ahead and check it out. And I will leave a link below. And the video title is the MAC address tables on connected switches. And it'll go through a quick summary of what we have discussed here. Again, there is another video called Sending the Frame to the Default Gateway. You can access through your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution, or I will leave a link below in my uh, description of this video so, uh, that I, I will post to my YouTube channel. So you can watch that in case you don't have access to the NetAcad materials. And that video is called the Sending the Frame to the Default Gateway. There is a lab in your Cisco NetAcad. Again, I will try to go through those labs and post to my YouTube channel. But however, if you have access to those labs, you should go ahead and do those labs right now before you watch the rest of this video. If not, um, I will post the lab video later on my YouTube channel and I will leave a link below. Switch speeds and forwarding methods. So we're gonna look at the switch speeds and how the forwarding methods work. Frame forwarding methods on Cisco switches. Switches use one of the following forwarding methods for switching data between network ports. Store and forward switching, cut through switching. Store and forward switching uh, can be described as a frame forwarding method receives the entire frame 
and computes the CRC. If the CRC is valid, the switch look up the destination address, which determines the outgoing interface. Then the frame is forwarded out of all uh, out of that correct port. So store and forward um, switching. Take the frame and check the CRC. And if the CRC is valid, the switch will look it up the destination address and determine the outgoing interface. And then the frame will be forwarded out of that correct specific port associated with that outgoing interface. Cut through switching, which is the other type, uh, use the frame forwarding method forwards the uh, so, I mean, in this frame forwarding method, it forwards the frame before it is entirely received. At a minimum, the destination address of the frame must be read before the frame can be forwarded. So it's not going to check CRC completely, but instead, it just at a minimum, just check the destination address and the frame, uh, you know, must be forwarded as soon as that it reads the, you know, I mean, try to read the destination address and then just forward it. That's what it called cut through switching. The big advantage of store and forward switching is that it determines if a frame has errors before propagating the frame. When an error is detected in a frame, the switch discards the frame. Discarding frames with errors reduces the amount of bandwidth consumed by corrupt data. Store and forwarding switch, store and forwarding switching, sorry. Store and forward switching is required for quality of service or QoS analysis on converged networks where frame classification for traffic prioritization is necessary. For example, VoIP uh, data streams uh, need to have priority over web uh, browsing traffic. So if you have a VoIP system, uh, in your um, business network or home network and you also have data where people access in the internet the VoIP all packets always have to have priority otherwise you know uh, VoIP uh, system won't work uh, for now that's what you, that's all you need to remember for this course in the future I will go through a VoIP lectures uh, so you'll understand how exactly that works so the forward uh, so sorry so the store and forward switching is a must for QoS, but there are advantages uh, for using, you know, either or in certain situations, like store and forward switching and cut through switching. We're going to look at that cut through su switching now. In cut through switching, the switch acts upon the data as soon as it received, even if the transmission is not complete. The switch buffers just enough to like just enough of the frame to read the destination mac address so that it can determine to which port it should forward out the data the switch does not perform any error checking on the frame so this is an important thing you should remember for your exam in cut through switching the switch does not perform any error checking of the frame there are two variants of cut through switching. There are fast forward switching and fragment free switching. In fast forward switching, it offers the lowest level of latency by immediately forwarding a packet after reading the destination address. Because fast forward switching starts forwarding before the entire packet has been received, there may be uh, times when the packets are relayed with errors. The destination network interface card or destination NIC discards the faulty packets upon uh, receival. Fast forward switching uh, is the typical cut through uh, method of switching uh, currently in use. Then we have the fragment free switching, which is another cut through uh, switching method. Uh, it is a compromise between a high latency and high uh, integrity of the stored and forward switching. Uh, and the low latency and reduced integrity of fast forward switching, the switch stores and perform an error check on the first 64 bytes of the frame before forwarding. 
I'm going to repeat that because I think it probably, uh, yeah, I said it in a confusing way. So it's a compromise between high latency and high data validity or integrity. Okay. And it performs an error check on the first 64 bytes of the frame and just forward after that. Because most network errors and collisions occur during the first 64 bytes, this ensure that a collision has not occurred before forwarding the frame. So it still check that first 64 bytes and because most of the network errors, not all, but most of the network errors and collisions occur on that first 64 bytes, it still ensure that the collision has not occurred before forwarding that frame. So that's an important concept that you should remember. Memory buffering on switches. An Ethernet switch may use a buffering technique to store frames before forwarding them or when the destination port is busy because of congestion. Sometimes you probably hear on the news or uh, when you speak to people, network congestion. So, well, one of the way that you can actually mitigate this is the switches using memory buffers. So, there are port-based memory and shared memory. So the port-based memory can be uh, described as a frame are stored in a queues that are um, linked to specific incoming and outgoing ports. A frame is transmitted to the outgoing port only when all frames ahead in the queue have been successfully transmitted. So a frame will wait in that queue until the frames before it has been transmitted. It is possible for a single frame to delay the transmission of all frames in memory because uh, of a busy destination port. Because the other frames behind that single frame that is being delayed is has to wait until that frame has been transmitted. This delay occurs even if the other frames could be transmitted to open destina destination ports because the that frame at the front is holding the entire queue back. Shared memory is uh, different from port based memories. In shared memory deposits all frame into a common memory buffer shared by all switch ports and the amount of buffer memory required by a port is dynamically allocated. So based on how many frames in each port uh, it's just going to dynamically allocate the memory. The frames in a, the buffer are dynamically linked to the destination port enabling a packet to be received on one port and then transmitted on another port without moving into a different queue. So that's kind of an advantage. The shared memory buffering also result in larger frames that can be transmitted with fewer drop frames. And this is, an, uh, this is important with asymmetric switching which allows for different data rates on different ports. Uh, I will go into depth of asymmetric switching in a different video, but for this lecture, just remember asymmetric switching is when we are switching uh, frames and packets uh, for different data uh, with different data rates on different ports. There are more bandwidth can be allocated on certain ports. For example, in shared memory switching, we can have a, a server uh, that has a website or a FTP file server uh, that require a way more bandwidth than let's say just an end computer like a laptop. So that we can actually alloc you know, do differential uh, bandwidth allocations with shared memory buffering. Duplex and speed settings. Two of the most basic settings on a switch are the bandwidth, which is the speed, and the duplex settings for each individual port. The reason why the speed is in, uh, you know, those inverted the, the, the brackets is that uh, band is not technically a speed, but you can look at that as a speed. So the two most important basic setting is the bandwidth and the duplex uh, settings for individual switch port. It is critical that the duplex and the bandwidth settings match between the switch port and the connected devices. Because if they are not matched, that could create network congestion and slow down the network and create other network problems. There are two types of duplex settings used for communications on an ethernet network. Full duplex, which are both ends of the connection can send and receive simultaneously, 
half duplex. Only one end of the connection can send at a time. For example, Wi-Fi is, as I mentioned before, all is going to be half duplex. In full duplex, both send and receive at the same time. In half duplex, one send, wait for it, receive the data, then the next person send and receive the data and wait in between when sending and receiving. Auto negotiation is an optional function found on most Ethernet switches and network interface cards. It enables two devices to automatically negotiate the best speed and duplex capabilities. So for example, excuse me, for example, if you have uh, in modern day uh, network interface cards, if you have a network interface card that is full duplex and a network interface card that is half duplex, one of those cards can auto negotiate and decide whether they're both going to switch back in, fall back into the uh, half duplex because maybe the other net network interface card cannot do full duplex or both going to switch to full duplex so they can communicate. Gigabit Ethernet ports only operates in full duplex. So if you have set up two gigabit uh, Ethernet ports, one in half duplex and one in full duplex, it's just not going to work. You must have both as at full duplex. And that's what exactly we're going to discuss in this slide quickly. So the duplex mismatch is one of the most common causes of performance issues on 1000 megabyte per second Ethernet links. Remember, gigabit always going to be full duplex, but in other ones like 1000 megabyte per second um, Ethernet link, it could be half duplex, one of the, uh, the, the intermediary networking devices, so end devices, right? So when it occurs, on one port on the uh, link operates at half duplex uh, and then the other port operates at full duplex. So basically the mismatch occurs when you know uh, when you have a network engineer or a technician have put uh, one of the ports in full duplex and the uh, other end of the device, uh, dev other end of the line we have, we have a device with uh, half duplex. So you have full duplex on one end and half duplex on the other. And this can occur when one or both ports on a link are, are reset and the auto negotiation process does not result in both links uh, partners having the same configuration. So auto negotiation process could fail. It also can occur when users reconfigure one side of a link and forget to reconfigure the other. That is probably the most common uh, network engineering, network technical issue that you might come across with uh, duplex uh, and full duplex, half duplex systems. Basically, you configure one of your Cisco switches, let's say here, and you forget to configure the next switch, switch as full duplex, and it has been hard uh, configured into half duplex. That will definitely result in this issue. So both sides of the uh, link should have auto negotiation on, or both sides should be have it off. You can have this one auto negotiate and this one auto negotiation turn off. You have to have either both turn on or both turn off. The best practice is to configure both Ethernet switches as full duplex because in modern day, it, all gigabit switches already, all, all, already have full duplex anyway. And uh, you should always configure both switches as a best pra practice uh, as uh, full duplex switches. There is no reason why you should be using half duplex on a LAN network, in other words. Auto MDIX. Connections between devices once required the use of either a crossover or a straight through cable. However, the type of cable required depend on the type of interconnecting devices in the old days. A direct connection between a router and a host required a crossover cable, for example. With modern day, most switches and end devices have auto MDIX. So what auto MDIX do, it, when it is enabled, the switch automatically detects the type of cable attached to the port and configures the interface accordingly. So regardless of whether you are using a crossover cable or a straight through cable, the auto MDIX is going to uh, figure that out and fix the problem for you. The auto MDIX feature is enabled by default on switches running Cisco iOS release 12.2, 18SE or later. However, the feature could be disabled uh, 
uh, by a network administrator or someone who's working on the switch. For this reason, you should always use the correct cable type and not uh, you know, depend on the auto MDIX feature to figure out uh, if the connections are done properly. The auto MDIX can be re-enabled using the MDIX auto interface configuration command on your Cisco uh, switches and routers. And I will uh, do a demonstration of different types of cable uh, and how those cable can be used between uh, like switches and routers and switches and end devices and routers and end devices. Uh, and I will post that on my uh, YouTube channel later. So uh, Cisco and many other organizations and academic institutions recommends that you use the correct type of cable and do not depend on auto MDIX. However, for most, however, for most home users, Auto MDIX is a lifesaver. So you can use any cable with mod most modern uh, switches and routers, uh, uh, whether it's a crossover or, or a straight through cable and the Auto MDIX will figure things out and make the connections. So that's what you need to get out of this slide. We have come to the end of this lecture and I'm gonna quickly go over a summary of what we learned. We learned Ethernet operates in the data link layer and the physical layer. We learned the Ethernet standards define both in the layer two protocols and the layer one tech protocols and technologies. Ethernet uses LLC and MAC sub layers of the data link layer to operate. Ethernet frames fields are preamble, start frame delimiter, destination MAC address, source MAC address, uh, the ether type data, and frame checking sequence CFCS, right? Uh, then uh, the MAC addressing provides a method for device identification and the data link layer of the OSI module. So remember the OSI model. So the MAC addressing provides the method of device identification at the data link layer of the OSI model. So you can have two devices in your internal network with the exact same MAC address because it, it has to be a unique MAC address for every single network interface. And Ethernet MAC address is a 48-bit address expressed using 12 hexadecimal digits or six bytes. When a device is forwarding a message to an Ethernet network, Ethernet header includes the source and the destination MAC addresses. In Ethernet, Different MAC addresses are used for layer two unicast, broadcast, and multicast communications. We also learn a layer two Ethernet switch makes its forwarding decisions based on the layer two Ethernet MAC address. The switch dynamically builds the MAC address table or you know the, the CAM table by examining the source MAC address of the frame receive on a port. So they're gonna associate the MAC address to a port number. The switch forwards frames by searching for MAC match between the destination MAC address in the frame and the entry in the MAC address table. Switches use one of the following forwarding methods for switching data between network ports, uh, store and forward switching and cut through switching. And there is also two types of cut through switching, fast forward and the fragment free. You need to know the differences between all of these items. Two methods of memory buffering when you are forwarding uh, frames are port based memory and shared memory. And you should also know the difference between the port based memory and shared memory and why uh, uh, you know each one is important and which one is used in QoS. You should know that as well. There are two types of duplex settings used for communications on an ethernet network, which are full duplex and half duplex. And again, you should know what they are and what we most commonly use today, which is full duplex. We rarely see half duplex in modern day. And that is the end of this lecture. I have posted the previous lectures uh, uh, on my YouTube channel and you can go and check it out on the playlist. 
in the future uh, next few days i will be posting the next few lectures associated with the cisco ccna introduction to network uh, course series and if you have any questions or concerns please don't uh, hesitate to leave a comment below and i will always try to answer your questions associated with this lecture and please make sure to thumbs up this video uh, and subscribe to my channel so that when the next few lectures get posted you will be the first one to watch my lectures if you have any other questions as i mentioned always leave a comment below until next time have a nice day